specialize in the reality of how people lived in pre-colonial India and who were the power holders. Tell us more about the Jati structure of that period so we can get an understanding, a good picture of how society lived before the colonizers arrived. Mm. I'm going to qualify that, that I specialize in a small part of India, as, as an Indian especially who knows a little bit about India. I mean, the first thing we must acknowledge is that in one lifetime, no one can know everything about India. I certainly do not. So I make no claims about that. Only about a very small part of India and a very small time period. Um, and that's all uh, my capacity enables me at this time. And if I keep learning throughout my life, I will know a little bit no more, but not all of it. Um, so, uh, but I just want to digress a little bit about the nature of history writing. It's easy to write history with colonial records, which is why most people continue to parrot and reparrot all the colonial taxonomies and based on colonial records. They're written in English. Most Indians who go into the academic system, their first language is English. They find it easier to read and colonial records are better maintained. If you really want to write indigenous history, you have to go and study local and vernacular records, which is infinitely harder. I did my PhD based on vernacular records, so I can tell you it takes, I mean, I could read an India office file. I could read a hundred pages in one day. It took me a week often to read one page from a vernacular text because it's coded and it's written for people who are in that communication. It's not really meant to be read by anyone else except people who are doing that business. In this case, account books. So that is why history is written, because sometimes the reasons are not deep or detailed or even malicious. They're based on pettiness, like the logistics. It's easier to write uh, history based on colonial sources. But is it the right history? The answer is no, because it's a very narrow understanding for foreigners gaze of India. And those foreigners often don't speak the language, have been shipped in from school in Britain, hey, go rule over this thousand square kilometers of a foreign country. And their understanding is that of a TikToker going to India and trying to make a, you know, their, uh, hey, this is what India is. So their minds are no more expansive than a backpacker going to India today. They do not know more about India. They do not speak the language. They are not specialists. And yet we treat their accounts as if they must be the greatest root in the world. They are not. That's one thing. Um, and uh, uh, what was the question that you asked me? Sorry, the, my digression got extra long. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, I was asking you to talk about the way power was oh, yes. distributed amongst yes. the Jathis and how society functioned before yes. the British so arrived. Let me make it clear as an academic that uh, are we trying to say that India does not have any discrimination against anyone? No, that's not true. Society is may have a philosophical understanding that you shouldn't have a discrimination. As Pandaji said, yes, we are, we are based on karma and punarjan. So the idea that if you do uh, ill karma against someone, you're probably likely, the idea that you're probably likely to suffer the same sort of ill karma from them in another life is, is a living, living idea that forms uh, and informs behavior, certainly. But uh, in practical terms, a discrimination occur? Of course it does. It's human nature. If you are, if you live as a very good Hindu, you will not, you will live like a sant, as in you will not try to harm any jeev whatsoever. That is the attempt, not accrue any extra pap or any extra rin than that those that we are forced to accrue. Um, um, but uh, human nature decrees that there is discrimination. Often there is systemic discrimination. Yes, that is true. But is it based on some kind of scripture-based caste or one system? No. It is not. And the period of Indian history that I study, for example, the 18th century and the, and the 19th century, we are still looking at an extremely fluid jati uh, sort of um, fluctuation in terms of power holding. So, for example, the biggest uh, rulers of uh, 18th century in India, who in fact ruled India in the 18th century, the majority of it, were the Marathas. Now, who are the Marathas? They're not a homogeneous community or a jati there, formed a very different community packings, very different jati identities, who come together from a certain part of India and decide that, hey, we don't like being ruled by uh, by Islamists, or essentially who the Mughals were, and we're going to go and form and carve out our own samrajya, which is what they end up doing. So this is a fairly well-known fact. Chhatrapati uh, Shivaji Maharaj is a kanabi. 
So they're all cultivators. Some of them are cowherds. Some of them, you know, all have different sort of uh, um, professions which would be defined as shudra within a classical varna structure uh, under certain definitions. But they all become kshatriya. They are they assume kshatriya roles. They're expected to follow kshatriya codes of honor by the traditional ho- owners of kshatriya status, which is the Rajputs in North India. So when they find that a Maratha ruler or a leader hasn't performed or he did some looting or he did something or the other, they say he did not behave in a Kshatriya way. This is, we can see that in the correspondence and records, which means to say, although there was no endogamy or there was no intermarriage between the Rajputs and the Marathas, and the reasons for that are different and complex, although there was one, made, there was an attempt that could have happened uh, had things not gone other way. So it's not as if they did not explore the concept of let's get these two Kshatriya communities linked up. Um, but that didn't happen in the 18th century. But they did accept them as being fellow Kshatriyas. So the fact that because they were ruling and they were holders of power. Uh, so let's look at, and this continued even when the British had written a caste system, an entire trope about, hey, this is what India is with a strict caste system. Um, Sayaji Rai Gaikwad, who is one of the most influential and most progressive and uh, genius ruler by any terms, he was the ruler of Baroda from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. He lived as a cowherd. He was from the Gaikwad family of Baroda. He lived as a cowherd till he was 12 years old, because that is who the Gaikwards are. Gaikwad means people who look after cows, like Gopals. So, um, that's the history of the Jati structure. And then he goes on to become one of India's most powerful rulers, one of the most enlightened rulers. I mean, he sets up universal adult suffrage and universal education, including women with moving libraries, the rest of it, you know that. So he was a cowherd, and then he becomes a Kshatriya ruler. So, and one of the, if people want to delve into it in detail, I suggest reading this book by, um, Nicholas Dirks, and he writes about a small principality in South India called Puddukottai. And it is about, this is, I'm talking about North India, this is the same, exactly the same thing in South India, which is communities which hold the power to rule, assume Kshatriya status. The rulers of Puddukottai are from a community who is considered a lower and backward community, even a hundred miles from Puddukottai. So Jati structure allows jatis to assume power and that changes their varnic their varnic identification so if this is the one takeaway from this talk you should take that that in the practice of living in india jatis did not have a fixed varnic stratification their role and definition dependent dependent upon the role that they were performing in the society and there was great flux jatis from untouchable communities shudra communities uh, fight, cultivating communities all assumed Kshatriya status at some point because they assumed political power and the right to rule. And also Brahmins did that as well, as I mentioned the Peshwas. They became Kshatriyas. And the rulers of Mewar, who are the primary Rajput rulers, who are considered to be the primary holders of Kshatriya status from the 8th century onwards, their origins are Brahmins. Their, 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 their uh, sort of genealogy links them to Brahman origins, but they assume Kshatriya rule. Uh, they become a Kshatriya because they are ruling. So that is the truth of the lived reality of how Varn and Jati interrelated in power holding in India. Deepakaji, thank you so much for sharing that uh, deep dive into that time period. I'd come across some elements of it. I skirted through Dirk's book in my research as well. But it's uh, my findings were exactly the same, that there was a huge level of fluidity. I also uncovered a work by um, Professor uh, Mani Shankarji, in which he revealed that um, 400 of the 605 principalities and kingdoms which were extant when the British arrived were ruled by Shudra kings. And in my book, I write that um, one of the most famous mandirs where... Uh, uh, Ramakrishna Padmahans did his seva was actually constructed by a Shudra queen, Rani Rajmohini. And so, you know, it was quite commonplace for people to adopt rulership according to ability and need of the time and not be prevented by this notion of a hereditary, hierarchical, endogamous, rigid, inflexible structure, which, as I said, is completely unnatural 
and therefore contrary to a Darshan based um, premise. <laughs> Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net.